the Nazis realized that language was a key propaganda weapon and pursued their vision of a global German-speaking empire. Hitler's deputy Hess threatened, when the thousand-year Reich arrives, English will become a minor Germanic dialect of no importance. Ironically, the Nazi party had learned their propaganda tricks from the British. The First World War unlocked the phenomenon of propaganda onto the modern world. And although the British had pioneered the conduct of propaganda, particularly overseas during the First World War, at the end of the war, they were very nervous about having um, been accused of conducting dirty tricks and manipulating people's minds. Other countries, particularly the new types of regimes that were emerging as a direct consequence of the First World War, Bolshevik, the Bolshevik Soviet Union, the uh, fascist Italy, and later Hitler's Germany were much more interested in um, utilizing the lessons of the British wartime experience and applying them to peacetime. And it was that competition that the British uh, found that they had to re-enter, not in wartime, but in peacetime. But the British government seemed reluctant to re-enter the propaganda battle, and most of the country was asleep to the ever-growing danger. Behind the scenes, however, Lloyd was one of the few who realized something had to be done. Of course, it became worse and worse, and a large uh, uh, section of the population just uh, drew a blind down and, and said it's not going to happen. And there were these few people, like Churchill and George, and I can't think of any others, but I'm sure there were. He was one of the pillars of, of the people who really did recognize the threat of Hitler. Lloyd's pressure on the government paid off. At St. James's Palace, London in 1934, the British Council was inaugurated, and Lloyd was a founder member. The task of the British Council was to counteract the fascist propaganda of Germany and Italy by promoting a positive image of Britain abroad. And central to its project was a teaching of English. Aims and objects of the British Council to make the life and thought of the British peoples more widely known abroad and to promote a mutual interchange of knowledge and ideas with other peoples. To encourage the study and use, to bring other people into closer touch with British ideals and practice in education, industry, and to afford them the opportunity of appreciating British literature, fine arts, drama, and music. What we wanted to convey was the fact that we had a unified history for a thousand years, that we had houses of parliament, we had government, we had people who obeyed the laws uh, mostly, that we had an educational system which we were proud of. The way in which the British Council spread this message was through a program of cultural activities many taking place in council offices abroad, called British Institutes. Paul Gotch made a pioneering film about his work in Egypt to publicize what the British Council was doing. We made a, a storyboard, or whatever it's called, and I thought we should show how the council thought its work should be done. Classes, library, social program, films. I showed two people, uh, myself as one, in a huge tweed jacket of very hot weather. The other was John Oldham. He was teaching them phonetics. But I wanted him to make it easier for them to understand why you said oo, e, a, o. He showed it on the board with the graph there of why the vowels were like that and what part of your anatomy you used to do what's called a labial, which is your lips. We tried to make it easier for them to learn English from somebody on the radio and in the films, to get them to listen to good English, <laughs> beautifully spoken English. the windswept hills and downs of England stand our earliest surviving buildings, such as Stonehenge, a 
temple whose gods are forgotten, but whose stones still stand where men dragged them thousands of years ago. In his English country home, George Lloyd sought seclusion from the frightening build-up to war. But he was a restless man, desperate to get back to the desert lands he had learned to love from his time in Egypt. He had a love of the countryside, but he could only love it from a distance. He actually, the place where he had to keep um, spending time was these open skies and, and these huge deserts. The strange thing about him as well was he, you know, he was the greatest British patriot and yet somebody who spent the least amount of time in, 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 in the country. His commitment was utterly to Britain's interests, Great Britain as he used to call it, but yet in fact he spent most of his life traipsing around in foreign lands. So he was actually very rarely in the country, he was so patriotic too. In the Arabian desert, Lloyd found a soulmate in Lawrence of Arabia. He met Lawrence and they became great friends. They were a complimentary duo in a way. And it wasn't just Lawrence's personality which captured George. I mean, he asked to, to actually be allowed to go and fight with Lawrence at one point because he felt, in terms of, 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 of what was going on in the world at that point, that was the most useful thing he could do. My grandfather was always with his eye on what he could do which was most useful. Lloyd grew increasingly troubled by events in the Middle East. The Suez Canal was the gateway to the British Empire in the East. So Egypt, although no longer a colony, was still strategically vital for Britain. These British interests were under a new threat from fascist influence, now turning its focus onto the Middle East. There was this sort of semi-fascist movement in Egypt. There was uh, the, the party, the Young Egypt party, Mosul al-Fatah. And they had uh, Mussolini and Hitler as, you know, the ideal. Before the war, I, for instance, I lived in a district uh, where we had about 200,000 Italians, for example. And these were really the students that went to the Italian schools. And I remember every Sunday, they used to go out with their uh, music, with the drums and all that thing, dressed in uniforms, uh, young fascists. And people used to cheer them because it's just colorful. The British Council sent Lloyd on a mission to work out where it could most effectively concentrate its efforts. Lloyd made a lightning tour of Egypt, Palestine, Cyprus, Iraq, Turkey and Greece. What he discovered confirmed his fears. There was a battle of broadcasting to express their opinion to the Arabic world. So uh, the Germans had an Arabic uh, broadcasting station. The Italians had an Arabic broadcasting station in Bari. Therefore, Lord Lloyd was so acute that he said, we've got to spend money in Egypt. We've got to have some counteraction to the propaganda of the Italians and the Germans in this country. I suppose you live in the country. Could you make a map of the... On return, Lloyd reported back to the Foreign Office. The Foreign Office, alarmed at the loss of British influence, immediately put pressure on the one organization who could have immediate impact in the propaganda battle, the BBC. The acerbic director general of the BBC, Sir John Reith, took this point very seriously. Reese's view of the pre-war situation in Europe was that uh, Nazism was a very serious threat, uh, fascism was a very serious threat of destabilization in Europe, uh, uh, and, and that the broadcast carried out by the Germans threatened the British position. and that in the case of the Italians, uh, it was the threat to the British dominance in the Middle East, in the Arab world, which was very great at that time. To counter fascist radio, Reith made plans to set up the BBC's own foreign language program, the forerunner of the World Service. The very first BBC foreign language program was the Arabic Service, and one of its key components was English lessons. The basic role of the Arabic service was to 
counter Axis propaganda and the command of English was an important element in that. I and mean, we could broadcast in Arabic and reach a large audience in Arabic, which we did. But the injection of English lessons in the Arabic language programs was a means of spreading, if you like, the message of English. While Nazi propaganda was broadcasting a utopian vision of the Third Reich, the BBC was instructing students how to get around London. You're not quite sure if this bus is the right one. What could you say to the conductor? Does this bus go to Piccadilly Circus? Or you might ask... Is this the right bus for Piccadilly Circus? No. Did you say anything like that, listener? Command of English began to be recognized as an important, not just cultural medium, but also as a political medium because of the, the message which was born al across the airwaves uh, through the English language, which, which is a message of culture and civilization and open societies and democracy and the rule of law and so on. dialects, the central one, Mercian, is the basis of modern English. This early English, brought from northwest Germany, was already a satisfactory language. We used to put on the BBC because they had interesting programs, you know, not, nothing to do with politics. We learned proper English, I mean, we learned all our grammar. We learned, uh, we had in our curriculum, we always had, the, every year we had a couple of Shakespeare plays. <laughs> Contradicted by official German sources. Home service. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. What happened at the start of the war was that there was a government statement that from that moment on, uh, the BBC and other similar organizations would come under government control because of the requirements of fighting the war. London is calling. London calling to the world, calling to a world at war. Lloyd's predictions about German aggression came true. Having laid the foundations of the British Council before the war, Lloyd now saw the opportunity for a massive expansion. He was appointed the new chairman and immediately pestered Foreign Secretary Lord Halifax for more funds. He needed this money and he was going to get it. By hook or by crook, and Lord Halifax eventually said, give it to him, anything to get rid of him. He must have been like a fly buzzing in everybody's ears yes. when he got going. He wouldn't give up. Lloyd's persistence worked. 
He concentrated council resources on the Middle East, where countries were coming under fascist influence. Normally, Britain was used to getting its way in Egypt, but now Egyptian King Farouk refused to declare war on Germany, and many Egyptians considered their country neutral. The powers that be weren't aware on which side these countries, which were vital for us to have as allies, were going to come. It was the same with Egypt. Now, Egypt was a vast country, vast. But we had problems. We had the army there. We were the old colonial power. Therefore, there was obviously a certain amount of resentment. And the English-British flag, the Union Jack, was fluttering all the time. That was hateful for a young boy to see the British flag, you know, fluttering and, and waving over Alexandria, my city, <laughs> my, my homeland, and so on. That's how the reaction was. On the one side, love for literature, poetry, music, and so on. On the other hand, hatred for the presence of an occupying colonial imperialist force. The task facing council officers was to nurture a love of British culture in order to undermine these anti-colonialist feelings. Pioneering British documentaries like Night Mail were screened in all possible locations, even the desert. This is the Night Mail crossing the border, bringing the check and the postal order, letters for the rich, letters for the poor, the shop at the corner of the girl next door, pulling up B took a steady climb, the gradients against her, but she's on time. We would make a film program, decide where he was going, the driver, who was also the projectionist, and he would set off in good time, get into the village, announce that there was going to be a film show, put up the screen, which of course attracted people, and then at the time that they'd been told, they would gather, come out from every nook and cranny and gather round. And it was, it was the most exhilarating experience to see them and to watch them watching the action on the screen. The future of the whole civilized world rests on the defense of Britain. First, of course, on the Navy. The British Council was technically an independent body, but particularly in wartime, there were very close ties with the embassies abroad. You would have what was called prayer meetings at the embassy, meetings every Friday to talk about what is going on in the country. Each attaché, each officer in the embassy, would be required to say what he'd been doing in the week, what he was trying to aim for, and what he was uh, hoping to achieve. So I, as a council officer, was very lucky to get all this information. I would know what politically was going on, which, of course, I couldn't officially have anything to do with, and they would know what I culturally was trying to do. Britain alone at bay. Not the first time she's been at bay. Council officers had to fight off suspicions they were actively engaged in spying. Any accusation that the council was used as the harbour for spies is absolute rubbish. We were expressly told what our duties were. We weren't inculcated in any way by the embassy. And we just got on with what we were doing, which was good relations. This is London. The government have given instructions for the following important announcements. All cinemas, theatres, and other places of entertainment are to be closed immediately until further notice. At that time, Europe was in darkness because there was a war going on there, and Cairo was ablaze with light because we were a neutral country. Everything was functioning, theatres was there, cinemas were galore. Street lights were dazzling like daytime. So it was a, a kind of a shock. Some people took it as a bad shock. How is it that Europe is suffering and you come to a country, the shops are plenty. You know, during the time, the Russians in England, uh, Europeans were hungry, 
so it was a shock to them to come and find life going smoothly as usual when everybody else was fighting. But some of them, of course, appreciated it. Most of the officers that were fighting in the Western Desert, they used to come for uh, weekends or and spend lovely time in Cairo. It, then they go to nightclubs. Oh, we must have had uh, hundreds of bars in Cairo. He is ultimately one. It was just those nasty Nazis who persuaded them to fight. And their Beethoven and Bach are really far worse. We had Noel Coward, for example. Uh, we got the Ensa people, you know. They used to give a lot of performances. And uh, the broadcasting used to cover these. So they had a music critic, and we had a lot of uh, concerts, for example, uh, symphony orchestras. BBC Symphony Orchestra will play Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. <laughs> Poetry reading, at most of the poetry reading, not all of the poetry reading was done at the British Council. Uh, drama, uh, play reading also was given at the British Council. Cultural events in Cairo may have been an enormous success, but in the countryside, such occasions were lost on the largely still illiterate population. So the council had to work out a special strategy to convey its message. The solution target the elite. I could see that we wouldn't be getting through in time to the fellaheen, the peasants, because there was such a, a dramatic difference between the people with money, the middle class and the other class, and the people who worked in the fields. Admiral, wonderful jobs, lovely people, but that was a, a system that was there. Therefore, we had to aim at the educated people. During the day, we used to go out saying, down with England, and in the evening, we went to the British Institute to learn English language and literature. Victoria College was just one of hundreds of schools that had been established throughout the empire to teach English. The British Council got involved by selecting and financing teachers to work in these elite institutions. Anybody who was anybody who would send their children to this Victoria College, I mean, you would pray to be able uh, to be accepted. Only a boy from Victoria College knew that he had to step back when a lady was passing. And only a boy from Victoria College knew how to kiss uh, a lady's hand in a very polite way. As a matter of fact, they were preparing a whole uh, generation to take over and rule, that would be the ruling generation. I think this is where my father uh, wanted so much that, uh, that I go to Victoria College, because when I'll grow up, uh, all my friends will be the, the ruling class. Age 10, I became fat. And my mom decided she wanted her boy to look wonderful and to be a genius. and be the best looking person in the world and she thought of that the only way to get me to lose weight was to send me in, in a, an English boarding school because uh, she, everybody said the food was so lousy in English schools and so she did so that's how I came to go to this school Victoria College I mean if I told you what our school song was like it was absurd, really, because it was all about glorifying Queen Victoria. When you think that you make little Arab children sing about Queen Victoria, it's uh, sort of absurd. They didn't make schools for poor people. There were only these sort of schools which were for the elite population, because they were the ones destined to later rule. And through this system of teaching the elite the language and the manners and the spirit of Britain, uh, the, the, the idea was to dominate those, those countries and to get English to be the first language in the world. These extravagant hopes for English looked increasingly fragile as military disasters multiplied in the Western Desert. 
General Rommel and his Panzer Force broke the siege of Tobruk, forcing a devastating Allied retreat and opening the door to Egypt and the Suez Canal. Nazi leader Hess's vision of English as a minor dialect seemed on the brink of materializing. When Rommel was nearing Alexandria, the British started to panic in the first place. And as I told you, they passed their panic to us, and, and, and we didn't understand. So, I mean, how, how could the British be beaten? I mean, we, we were <laughs> the British Empire was something that, uh, that uh, w w w was there for forever. Well, of course, many of us said, Jesus Christ, we don't talk German. Scott Fitzalbert here, and we're recording up forward in the desert. And you must forgive me if I'm shouting, because I'm shouting against the voices of British guns. We have victory. A, a remarkable and definite victory. A bright scene has caught the helmet. Just four months later, the British hit back at Rommel. The Battle of El Alamein was a resounding victory, the beginning of the end for Rommel. But further east, the calamitous loss of the colonies such as Singapore and Malaya began to cast doubt on the once great British Empire. Lloyd's vision of a worldwide network of British institutes was in danger. But then suddenly, new hope appeared. Come in, America. After Pearl Harbor a few months earlier, America had finally entered the war. The United States didn't have any way of communicating behind enemy lines. And there was a feeling that there should be some channel of communication. The available channels, the most effective one was radio. The voice of America was... The Americans realized that they too needed to counter the fascist propaganda. President Roosevelt inaugurated a new government radio station, the Voice of America, first transmitted in February 1942. That first broadcast had the words uh, these aren't exact, but they're close enough. We shall tell you the truth. The news may be bad or the news may be good, but we shall tell you what happened. In the past, the United States had pursued an isolationist stance, seldom looking beyond its own borders. But now as a new global power, the nation was forced to open up to the world. America had to learn at speed how to project a positive image of itself. So the states turned for advice to Britain, who had built up over 30 years of expertise in self-publicity. BBC was a model. They sent some people to New York. They had a liaison unit that helped give the initial voice people guidance as to how to go about this kind of international broadcasting and even some guidance on content. Hostilities will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight. This is London. London is a city of song and celebration and thanksgiving. At the end of the war, English was the language of the victors. The efforts of Britain and America to project themselves through the medium of English had brought hundreds of thousands into contact with the language. It was now spoken by over 200 million people all over the world and poised to sweep the globe. Churchill's American visit in early 1946 was more than just a vacation. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. All these famous cities and the populations around them lie in what I must call the Soviet sphere. With Germany's defeat and the rise of the Soviet Empire, German was never going to make it as the world language. French was losing its power as the diplomatic tongue as English got stronger and stronger. But a new threat to its power arose, Russian. 
Soviet bombardment of the world with Russian and anti-Western propaganda deeply concerned the West. The voice had a broadened mission. It was, if you will, a counter to what we felt was inaccurate disinformation coming from the Soviet axis. And the voice's role was to counter that, not just behind the Iron Curtain, but worldwide. And our effort was to propagate what we felt was accurate information. While we are trying to help build a world of freedom and justice among sovereign people, the masters of international communism are working constantly to tear down that kind of world. The need for broadcasting news and other programming elements in English was based on the very real belief that first, it was an effective way of transmitting information to people who'd had only limited English, but yet, because it was in English, had perhaps more credibility than broadcasts in their own native languages. That the accurate information was the English language broadcast. Throughout the world, there is widespread misunderstanding of the United States. By 1953, President Eisenhower decided to increase efforts to counter Soviet propaganda by promoting American culture. He founded the United States Information Agency, absorbing Voice of America under its roof. How do you sell American culture? You can't sell it in the same way that the French can sell their history or the British can sell their traditions. So you have to sell something a little bit different. And what they do in in indeed decide to sell is their very diversity, their very difference. And in this driving urgency to tell the world the truth about America, there is no organization with so many ways of sending it in so many languages to so many places as the United States Information Agency. The voice has been on the air in English for three minutes now. The giant radio console has taken over. Newsreel negatives are being developed right now. The last reel, 800 feet. Okay. Motion pictures are being swiftly edited. All I know is. I'm an independent sort of a cuss, and cleaning windows on a skyscraper is an independent kind of a job. You're out there on your own. Maybe that's why I like it so much. Sometimes the city's hardly big enough to hold us. We have to go where the sun reaches us straight and full instead of having to turn a hundred corners to find us. Music USA was one of the great successes in Voice of America program, with Willis Conover in charge of the program. His stock and trade was American jazz. He appealed to the audience. The audience tended to be younger, but not completely younger. There were many. And Willis was one of the great articulators, and with reason, that jazz represented an expression of democracy, an expression of freedom. It wasn't regulated by what was written on the paper. It permitted individual interpretation. So. With a wondrous new life in the forge of a lifetime, the finest new forge of a lifetime, in a beautiful, wonderful... Not only was government involved, politically motivated charities like the vastly wealthy Ford Foundation joined the fight against communism. And it became very quickly apparent as the colonials started to fade away that there were needs for more people who spoke English with confidence and authority. I've seen governments really badly crippled by the lack of communication, people avoiding writing a, a memorandum because they were uncertain of their English. As Britain withdrew from its empire, there emerged a battle to fill the political void. The Soviet Union tried to win over the hearts and minds of the former colonies. Britain and America countered this, using the English language as their weapon. They pushed English as the language of democracy and development. We felt, you know, that 
the English language would be a vehicle of influence for the good, for, you know, for peace and welfare and development uh, on these nations if they didn't abandon the English language for a very understandable objective of speaking their national language. Um, but we weren't going to, we didn't try and stop them speaking their national language. So I wanted to ensure that English as a second language, or as a foreign language, mostly second in the Commonwealth, was effectively learnt. There was early appreciation that these countries needed a national and international language that could relate them to the rest of the world. English was the language of development, the language of economic progress, and the language of international connection, and all kinds of things were being done in English that would be necessary to any country that wanted to join in this vast excitement about economic development that was going on in those years. The British colony of Singapore on the brink of independence was a case in point. It was a complex multiracial society and communists had exploited racial and linguistic tensions, resulting in devastating riots. So the big question was how to bring peace to Singapore's different races. Choosing English as its principal language was part of the answer. I believe there are two reasons why English was chosen as the language that had to be studied uh, by everyone in Singapore in order to make uh, Singapore's independence real. One was that the, the language itself, being neutral as it were to the Malays, the Chinese and the Indians, did not have the kind of uh, emotional overlay that these independent vernacular languages would have. And therefore the you know, English language would serve as a harmonizing language to bring the races together. And the second reason I believe was that the only way forward was for Singapore to speak a language which was becoming more and more the language that was going to be spoken by the international community. And therefore to make big impact you had to go to English. The British Council and the U.S. Information Agency quietly tried to influence the emerging nation. As in Egypt, the British targeted the nation's future movers and shakers by sending select students on scholarships to America and Britain. The British Council here were targeting people whose knowledge of Britain was still very bookish, and they wanted, I think the British Council wanted these uh, students to appreciate uh, some of the things behind uh, the apparent uh, p face that the British presented as a colonial power, which was, in, in the eyes of young people like we were then, uh, fairly negative. In a sense, being in England uh, was a, a strange uh, deja vu f uh, feeling, you know, of, oh, I know all this, but I knew it, of course, from textbooks and especially going through the countryside. It was a real thrill to drive through Kent and know that it was through the gardens of England and to see all those fields and so on. And it would take us to different parts of Britain to enjoy the Lake District for the landscape, but also for the poetry. Where we go to Shakespeare country, we go to D.H. Lawrence country, to Nottingham. The one I enjoyed most vividly, I can remember most vividly, is Thomas Hardy's country, so-called Wessex, down in the south. And uh, I had been reading all of Hardy's novels at that time uh, as a student and that was really extremely moving to me. I don't think the purpose was to convert me in any specific way, but I think what it did was to provide me with that opportunity of seeing other aspects of British life which we wouldn't have known otherwise and to have lived the rest of my life with that partial picture which I picked up from books and, uh, and the people I knew would probably have led to a very distorted view. Then a political disaster occurred for Britain, which was to be a major setback for the British Council. In November 1956, Britain with France and Israel invaded Egypt. President Nasser had seized control of the Suez Canal, owned by the Anglo-French Canal Company, 
and the British had taken this as a direct attack on their interests. I haven't thought at all that Britain would do any, uh, would begin any attack against us, because it was clear that any attack against us would affect the British position all over the Arab countries, and would mean the uh, end of the British relations and influence in the Middle East. When Nasser heard the you know, drone of British aeroplanes, he didn't believe that they were British. He thought it were, they were Israeli or American or whatnot. And when he was sure that these were the British aeroplanes, he was, you know, sort of astounded, very much surprised. He didn't expect it. Militarily, the invasion was successful, but within a day, a ceasefire was called. The United Nations and the United States condemned Britain for its old-fashioned gunship diplomacy. The image of the British Empire was uh, completely not only tarnished, but I think it was collapsed. I think it collapsed. And I think, I don't know, the general feeling is that the downfall of the British Empire began from there. Under financial pressure from America, British troops were forced into a humiliating withdrawal. For the Council, the fallout was disastrous. Council institutes were sequestered throughout Egypt, and the Council officers in Syria and Jordan had to evacuate to Britain. One wanted to hold one's head up. One realized that politically this was something so serious that it would take all the efforts of the Council in every country we worked in to try to make amends for what appeared to be so dramatic. Back at the Foreign Office, Suez sparked a major re-examination of the tarnished British image overseas. In desperation, a new minister for the information services was appointed, with a brief to make amends. Charles Hill was not the most auspicious of candidates, it seemed. His claim to fame was being a BBC radio doctor. I I've been working since uh, January on an overhaul of the overseas information services, and I shall... Uh, bring to the discussions today uh, the fruits of that uh, scrutiny. He had a wonderful bedside manner over the radio and you know when he would, uh, Charles Hill had spoken for a bit all your ailments vanished you know, you know, he told you they were not important. And this morning the subject is onycophagy. Bless my soul what a lovely word onycophagy. He was appointed as Minister of Information and Broadcasting. Um, I think that because he'd been the radio doctor, they felt he knew all about broadcasting. <laughs> so he was put in effective charge of the BBC, as well as the British Council, because they, you know, they came under the information budget. Teaching of English uh, overseas in 101 ways. That's to be greatly expensive. Charles Hill's solution was simple. Spend more money and target it better. The information services, the British Council and the BBC, were to take on a massively expanded role with a focus on spreading English. A lot of people felt that this was imperialism under a new guise. You know, here we were, OK, we'd lost political and economic control, but through language we would exert a political and cultural control. We would colonise the mind. Hill based his solution on a confidential cabinet report which outlined a breathtaking vision of the power of English for the first time calling for English to be the global lingua franca. It was written, Within a generation from now, English could be a world language. That is to say, a universal second language in which it is not already the native or primary tongue. Its expansion should take place under Commonwealth and US auspices. In order to achieve this uh, role of world language, it was going to require not just, you know, amateur f f philologists going around the world and so on, it was actually going to require a concerted policy. British-American cooperation began in Cambridge, and I think it was in 1961. It took uh, the form of, first of all, joint meetings between the British and the Americans, which took place, as I recall, annually. The news filtered to the field by each home office then, sending out through its message channels information about what we should be doing. We very much felt we were on the same team, if I may use that, that American expression, and uh, never felt competitive, but it was a good relationship. 
British and American government funds poured into the project. In developing countries like Singapore, now the economic miracle of Southeast Asia, the strategy paid off. English became key to its present success. The British and American joint plan involved setting up new language centers and universities throughout the region, which are in operation to this day. The third thing I want you to speak about with each other is the most stressful day. Part of today's success stems from the Americans' own particular teaching method using special English. The Voice of America introduced broadcast in a simplified language with a vocabulary of only 1,500 words, spoken very slowly. We announced today a new agreement with Egypt regarding the building of an Aswan Dam. That sort of approach, said slowly, with a very slight pause within words, between words. We were trying to teach a, a lingua franca. We were trying to teach a language in, with which people could get along in life and cope with situations that they would find. We didn't much care if people never read Walt Whitman. Uh, we didn't really much care. Uh, we should have, by the way. We should have done both, but we didn't. Uh, we tended to lean on the very practical, how do you get a taxi ride, how do you buy a pound of meat, uh, how do you walk down the street and get your shoes shined, and so forth. I speak English because I need to learn it for my job. I need English for my business. I speak English because I like it. English is uh, the global language. The society demands the good quality of English. I want to understand all yeah, English and uh, English culture. I speak English because I want to talk to many, many people. I speak English because it's one of the most important word languages. Speaking English is the only way forward. If we went for some other language like Chinese, I think we would have a problem. If we went for Singlish and tried to speak our own version, well, whom are you talking to? Just amongst ourselves. It will be incomprehensible to somebody outside. <laughs> What's the point? As PCK Private Limited is going global, we all need to know the lingua franca of international business. Hey, I thought English is good enough. <laughs> it is. Then why don't we need to know the lingo of the French? The lingua franca is English. Oh, so the French also speak English? No, I mean, yes, I'm mean, sure some of the French do speak English, but... Correct. <laughs> English should be the key to a Papua New Guinean being able to talk to an Ecuadorian, uh, you know, a, a North American Eskimo, I know you're not meant to call them that now, Intuit something, right? should be able to talk to a, a, a Tasmanian sheep farmer because there would be a common link. Aloysius! Mom, actually, the correct pronunciation of your son's name is Aloysius, not Aloysius. Huh? <laughs> It can't be. A L O Y S I U S is Aloysius. It is a common mistake made by Singaporeans, uh, but in fact the correct pronunciation is Aloysius. So that's really where this whole sort of Anglo American thing started in the producing a world language which would be internationally comprehensible. But having English as the global language is not without its problems. English is the common ground for all the races. It's a plus, but at the same time, there are some minuses. Uh, your sense of oneness, of rootedness here, is not quite as strong. Um, you, you are not, you, you are not English. You are not American. You are Singaporean. Now, what is that uniqueness? If you are Japanese, your language is part of the uniqueness. In Singapore, it's not. So what we have to do is to say, well, you learn English, but at the same time you learn your mother tongue, whether that's Chinese or it's Malay or it's Tamil or some other language. So you have some sense of roots, who you are, where you came from, how you came to be in this country as you are and confident of yourself and not a little Englishman. Despite the cultural problems, the spread of English seems unstoppable. The big push by the British and Americans paid off. By the mid-60s, already an estimated 350 million people spoke English, one-tenth of the Earth's population. 
and this expansion was propelled forward by the force of the global economy. The beginning of the spread must have been in the 60s, but it coincided really with the growth of the world economy as a world economy. There's, it's growth of globalism, which has meant that for business reasons, plus uh, the networks of communication between firms, between stock exchanges and so on, which are very complex worldwide systems in which English is obviously the common language. All that actually has contributed to the spread of English as, as a global language. Now the situation is different. I don't think culture has much to do with it. I believe that business has a lot to do with the spread of the English language as the language of the internet, of the computer, of stock exchanges, uh, all these uh, uh, aspects of business. Culture as a whole is receding. Business as a whole is advancing. English today has come loose from its moorings. It is no longer anchored in mother tongue countries like Britain and America. Instead, the worldwide demand to learn it has grown to the extent that the English language itself has become a business. The astonishing global wealth generated from English-related commerce is estimated at 5,000 billion pounds, and even the British Council is profiting. Today, it is the pursuit of money rather than the spread of culture that drives English teaching. The English language did develop as a commodity, there's no question about it. The British Council decided to develop paid language teaching um, as a major business in the sense that uh, the demand was incessant and clamant and it was not actually being met completely by the private sector. Uh, this reconciled the concept that the British Council was a, an official cultural agency with the fact that it was also in business in a big way. The British Council today makes £121 million pounds annually from English teaching and exams and reaches students in 109 countries around the world. The radio doctor, Charles Hill, could never have imagined such an English language explosion on the world scene and the extraordinary effects of his reforms. If there had been no USIA, no American, no British involvement in English teaching in the world today, <clears throat> where would we be? That's a, that's a fascinating question to speculate on. It's only speculation. I suspect it would be, um, first of all, uh, not, as, not as common a language. It would not be as extensive as it is today. No question about that. Second, I think it would be spottier. I think it would be random. There would be countries in which uh, there was no English spoken to speak, uh, to, to mention, uh, where English wasn't known. Third, I think it would be professional dom profession dominated. For example, the airlines industry obviously needed a common language. After the Berlin Wall came down and the Soviet Union collapsed, English, rather than Russian, instantly became the second language of the former Soviet sphere. This put the seal on English as a global lingua franca. But mother tongue countries like Britain and America are not necessarily the winners. In order to learn English, more and more countries are becoming multilingual. So speaking only one language, even if it's English, might put people at a disadvantage. Well, I think you will lose something if you are monolingual in English. Uh, first, there will be significant parts of the world which are still not dominantly English-speaking. I mean, the Latin Americans, China, for example, or Japan, or for that matter, um, Europe, although maybe to a lesser extent in Europe. And if you want to do business with them, if you want to understand them, then you have to have some appreciation of the language. Secondly, I think it gives you a one-dimensional view of the world. It's a rich environment, an English-speaking world, but there are non-English-speaking viewpoints, and if you speak a different language, then you appreciate the world differently. It's not just reading a different newspaper, but being able to follow or appreciate a different way of thinking, reasoning, different uh, historical experiences, mindsets. E-I-O E-I-O You throw your throne of you This earth of majesty This blood This seat of Mars Demi-paradise 
des Englands. I speak English because the business. I like it. Commercial uh, department. I need it. Society demand. I understand the English and uh, English culture. It's an important part of my future. BBC4 is available with others on cable.